Welcome everyone to Invisible Architecture. This is uh, our ongoing series and today we're going to be speaking about remote viewing. My name is Carol Sa, and our guest today is Angela T. Smith. Welcome Angela. Thank you and thank you for inviting me on your show. Yes, I'm going to read your impressive biography now. I mean, <laughs> I wish it was mine. You've been to so many fabulous uh, organizations and doing all of this research. So Dr. Angela Thompson Smith's primary qualifications were in nursing and social work in the UK. She immigrated to the US in 1981, where she worked in medical research in New Jersey and volunteered with the Psychophysical Research Laboratories, PRL, until being hired by the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Pair Laboratory. The five fascinating years working at Pair preceded a move to Las Vegas, Nevada to work as Mr. Robert Bigelow's research coordinator. And then in the mid 1990s, while studying for a PhD, she also trained in controlled remote viewing, CRV with Paul Smith and Lynn Buchanan. In 1999, Dr. Smith became a founding director and members of the International Remote Viewing Association and has served as a board member. Since the early 1990s, she's been training others in remote viewing, consulting on application projects in the US and abroad, and has written numerous books, including Remote Perceptions, SEER, and Tactical Remote Viewing. What? A bio. So I thought like before we get into the remote viewing, because some of these other things are so interesting to me, like the Pear Lab and Robert Bigelow, that maybe you could go we'll spend a little time going through those. So right. what did you do at Pear and what was Pear? Well, first of all, I started going down volunteering because I was working still in medical research with moms and babies. Um, at the next big town over in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And I'd heard about Pear, and um, Pear was doing a variety of research, um, particularly human computer interaction mm -hmm. or psychokinesis mm -hmm. using computers and other devices, uh, where the person, the operator, the individual who came in and volunteered, would sit in front of a computer. Uh, a random number generator or um, a drum or some other device, a water fountain, a pyramid, um, a little um, pendulum on a swing, um, trying to affect it with their mind, either to slow it down or speed it up or to get higher numbers or lower numbers. And this was fascinating. So I tried to... Yeah. I remember when... What is that? Oh, I, I don't know. Little voices from outside. They know you're oh God, little gremlins. <laughs> <laughs> I remember them doing one. It was really interesting where they, mm. they saw like, like if different sexes could do it, where they did two females together, two males together, a female male that weren't married, and then a male couple married, and they could make it like influence. Yes, them. yeah. They did all yeah. yeah, in fact, I did participate in a couple of those studies with my later um, husband, who's not my ex-husband, but still friends. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we, uh -huh. we got that thing zooming. I mean, it was incredible. Yeah. Oh, so you, you participated in the uh, experiments? Oh, absolutely. Oh. All the staff members participated whenever we had a free moment. Mm -hmm. um, and we did have people come in, students and interested people, uh, visitors all participated, whoever we could corral. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so I did a lot. I did a lot of uh, It was amazing because it was so out of the regular norm that, that it just could keep going for so many years. Yeah, I believe it was over 30. I wasn't able to go to the 30th anniversary, unfortunately, but... Um, yeah, they, and then they ran out of funding towards the end, so they closed down, sadly. Uh, well, anyhow, I, I looked up some stuff on PEAR to see. It's, 
they have a whole list of all the experiments they did and you can um, go to them to see what they were. Mm -hmm. and so they're online. So that's like really good. And then yeah. we have Robert Bigelow. Can you tell who he is? And then I think a lot of people will know him from the Skinwalker Ranch. I don't know what you yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I heard about him when I, I was searching around towards the end of the five years. Um, my the funding that funded me was coming to an end and I had to look for another position. So I was look, searching around and one of my um, professors had um, heard about a position opening up with uh, Robert Bigelow, who is a real estate mogul in Las Vegas, um, mm -hmm. has uh, lots of, uh, you know, sort of daily, weekly, yearly um, little rental units that um, he's made, he had made his profession. Mm -hmm. And he had a, was starting up a foundation, the Bigelow Foundation, and was looking for a research uh, coordinator. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I'd like to try that. So we got in touch and I came out and visited because I'm in near Las Vegas now. Mm -hmm. uh, came out and visited Las Vegas and um, we visited the university and um, I stayed with him. It was almost two years. We had a little radio show going. Um, visits up to north of Las Vegas to visit various interesting UFO hotspots. Oh, so it was about UFOs. Okay, yeah. Okay. It was partly UFO, partly parapsychology, partly healing alternative health. We covered a lot of a uh, lot of ground. Uh huh. And then he bought a Skinwalker Ranch, right? That was after I left. Okay, yeah. Okay, and can you just tell a little bit about Skinwalker Ranch, why it's so infamous? <laughs> it's up in Utah, Duchesne, Utah, and a colleague of mine has a ranch right next door to it. So oh. I get first hand info. Oh, that's great. Of stuff that's happening up there. And stuff happens on his ranch too. His name's Ryan Burns. You should have him on sometime. Oh, okay. Um, wow. Yeah, and uh, Skinwalker Ranch had been owned by several ranchers who had noted really weird stuff happening there. Anomalous lights, things moving, um, anomalous sightings of uh, weird animals like a giant wolf, um, mm -hmm. others. And um, so he bought it and set up a research station there. Oh. Um, to look at, scientifically look at some of these events and mm -hmm. see if they come to any conclusion. And have you heard he's come to any conclusions? Well, he ended up selling it. Oh, okay. Um, and I think, I don't know how many years, it may have been 10 years or more that he owned it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, all the experience, all the information is still classified. So it hasn't been released. Some of it's released out. You know, some of the um, people who worked there have spoken about their experiences yeah. and written books. But um, the all of the scientific stuff is still uh, not much, not known. <laughs> and um, it was bought by another real estate developer, um, a mogul who lives in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And... Um, He's carrying on the work, and of course, he now has a, ra a TV show about Skinwalker Ranch. So I think like the third episodes are coming out. Oh, okay. And so, is the government involved in any of their research or not? Not in this second second episode. I think this second uh, round with the new owner. Oh, okay. Um, but definitely with Robert Bigelow. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that's amazing that you your colleague is right next door and then has this, the same kind of events happening, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you quickly one event he had, which was on his land, he had a very large shipping container that mm -hmm. he used for storage. And he'd had it uh, brought up there. And um, they found, he and his caretaker had found it one day, moved from its position right up against the cabin. You could hardly get see the light through where it Those was. are so heavy. The Sorry? Containers are so heavy. They're huge. Yes. Exactly. 
full of stuff yeah. and um, no drag marks or anything. I mean, there was no indication of how it had been moved. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, these earth energies are moving there. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So now to get into the next part of your life, for, I suppose yeah. this was all happening uh, into the remote viewing. So, right, yeah. Well, at Pear, we were also doing, as well as the PK work, the psychokinesis work, they were researching so called, something called precognitive remote perception, which was basically the same as remote viewing, but called some a little bit different because the remote viewing was done precognitively or before somebody went out to a location to view it and try and share it with the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd already been doing that. And then um, Paul Smith and others and myself were interested in perhaps revitalizing some of the remote viewing research that was done at Stanford Research Institute and other places and bring it to the public and perhaps start up an organization to bring that information to the public. Because Stanford Research started in the 70s, right? It was a government, was a yeah. government endeavor and lasted over 20 years. Right? Yeah, yeah. And um, so it was, so we we set up and went, I'm, I have a small PowerPoint to show you with some photos okay. of those wow. events too in a moment. Um, but um, yeah, I started... Uh, working with, we, we called the organization the International Remote Viewing Association. And this year is our 25th anniversary. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of remote viewing. It's a lot of remote viewing and a lot of organization. And when we get into it, I, from different things, from reading your stuff and all of that, like some of these things you remote view, you don't find out the results for 10 or 20 years. So you right, got to really yeah. stay in it for a long time. I'll give you one quick example. Um, the Rings of Saturn, I was uh, what we call tasked or asked to do a project back in uh, 94 about the Rings of Saturn. And it wasn't until the Cassini probe went to, uh, to view and to film the Rings of Saturn and then shared that with the public that I finally got information back and got feedback, as we call it, and uh, was right on a lot of uh, things that I had perceived there. So how many years uh, was that? That was that was 11 years, I believe. 11 years um, before you found out. And then, and then somebody else at NASA had put out some photos 20 years after the event. Wow. <clears throat> so I was able to get a little bit more feedback there. Yeah, sometimes you have to wait for your feedback. <laughs> you have to be really <laughs> patient in this field. So you want to uh, give the... Um, what remote viewing is? You said you had something to share. Yeah, I'll, I have a really quick, a very short PowerPoint that I'll go through. Okay. It takes about Let's do maybe that. 10 minutes or okay. less. So yeah. you can do it down below, right? Where it says share? Yeah, I'm, I've am i got it here. Okay. Have you, can you see that? Yep. Excellent. I'll move me and you up there. Okay, I'm going to put it on slideshow feature from the beginning. So this is an introduction, putting remote viewing, RV, as we call it, uh, for short, to work. I own a company called MindWise Consulting that uh, does remote viewing work, and uh, I'm also a writer. And this was the original definition that a lot of people forget. As observed in the laboratory, the basic phenomenon appears to cover a range of subjective experiences variously referred to in the literature as autoscopy in the medical literature, exteriorization or dissociation in the psychological literature, simple clairvoyance, traveling clairvoyance or out-of-body experience in the parapsychology liter literature, or astral projection in the occult literature. We choose the term remote viewing as a neutral descriptive term free from prior, prior associations and bias as to mechanism. So this was Hal Puthoff and Russell Targ in 76. Um, this was the first official write-up in an official journal of the IEEE, 
and this was a paper called The Perceptual Channel for Information Transfer Over Kilometer Distances. And so they were saying here, what we call these other things, we are now calling remote viewing. Um, so this was the very first um, confirmation that the term remote viewing was being used publicly. Um, so remote viewing was developed by Ingo Swan and Dr. Hal Puthoff as both a research, research tool and as an application mm -hmm. protocol. First developed at Stanford Research Institute at Menlo Park, California, and then by the US military and by scientific research institutions, including the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, FAIR, that studied the topic under the research term precognitive remote perception or PRP. You can still find articles online. Okay. And since the closing of the SRI research, the military unit and the PAIR programs, because the military took it on after SRI, and the PAIR program, former staff members have continued to train adult students in remote viewing protocols. And that's one of the things I do, is I train people in remote viewing. <clears throat> so, this after, was after, so after SRI closed, then the military just took it over. Yeah, I think there was a little overlap there, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years overlap. And then oh, okay, so that's who's running it now. Yeah, and this was um, at uh, Lynn Buchanan's uh, house in, in um, Alamogordo, wow. New Mexico. And this was Russell Targ and Hal Puthoff exchanging cards. They hadn't seen each other for about 13 years. Wow. So they were, these were the two founders of the term remote viewing. And this was the team. And there's me, the one, the lone woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was the first team, the International Remote Viewing Association at Linda Cannon's house, where we inaugurated the organization. Wow. And you can see a whole bunch of folks there. Well, those are oh, really yeah. famous names in remote viewing to, the, to this day, yeah. Yes, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what I do, tactical remote viewing. Um, tactical remote viewing is not anything, I don't do anything, I was never in the military, although I've worked with the military uh, doing some projects. Um, so the taking of remote viewing from research and training programs into practical applications. I worked for a gentleman, a businessman for nine years and we did tactical remote viewing, um, actual practical taking remote viewing into the real world. Um, I so remember seeing that, like, so he was like a businessman, so it would be with his editors and York, all of that. Yeah, New York businessman, very innovative, very forward thinking. Uh -huh. um, I can't tell you his name because I promised way back, yeah. he's passed away now, yeah. I call uh -huh. him Jay. <laughs> Uh, so tactical remote viewing operations are now being used in real world operational missions. So remote viewers are doing real work out there, not just practice targets or, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, we're going out there and doing the work. Mm -hmm. So MindWise Consulting, which is my company, um, along with a group of trained viewers, have been carrying out projects since 2003 for private, corporate, and government clients. Many of these projects have pushed the envelope of remote viewing. We've done everything super nuts. Um, and it's remote viewing is basically martial arts for the mind. I'd like to put that. Well, in. that's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, that's not one of mine. That's one of um, uh, Joe McMonagall's oh. term. So this is what most people think of as tactical. If you try to define the term, um, you often come up with images and definitions of military tactical operations. This is just one aspect of the term. It has a much wider definition. So the Merriam-Webster dictionary says, the definition, and this is a definition I use, small scale operations serving a larger purpose. So you have lots of viewers, um, doing the same project and at different times of the project, made or carried out with only a limited or immediate end in view, adroit in planning or maneuvering to accomplish a purpose. 
So it's a very practical application of remote healing. So my uh, quote from my company is practical options for a changing world. And MindWise is in the business of finding solutions using established remote viewing protocols and analysis. Because I trained in coordinate remote viewing with um, Lynn Buchanan and Paul Smith, who were ex-military trainers. And also, I had out-of-body experiences since I was a child. So I will often mm -hmm. bring that skill in, as well as uh, rune play um, and other other tools that I've used over the years and learned over the years. What can we use? What can remote viewing do? Um, trained remote viewers using established protocols combined with their natural intuitive abilities can perceive up to 70 to 80% accurate information about hidden pictures and video targets. And these proven skills have been used to solve crimes, find missing people and locate lost or hidden items, and as well as a multitude of other projects. I mean, there's really no limit to what it can be used for. Who uses remote viewing? Um, it's been used by businessmen to run buy and sell companies, has assisted realtors in locating and selling properties, and helped thousands of people solve business and other problems. But remote viewing is not about channeling, mediumship, life coaching, psychometry, or other related abilities, but does share some commonalities. So when someone says to me, oh, it's all out-of-body experience, no, but it does share some, some commonalities mm -hmm. uh, between the abilities. So I had um, at one, well, we'll do that when you're through with this, about that one that um, even the LAPD gave you um, commendations for solving uh some was that the DJ <laughs> murder DJ yeah, murder case? Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk about that when you're Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is the last slide. So RV is alive and kicking. Over five decades of professional professional research and development have gone into remote viewing. And the US military funded and operated remote viewing for over 20 years. That remote viewing has been researched and developed at universities and other academic institutions for over three decades. And did you know about the dozens of remote viewing schools around the US and abroad that have trained thousands of students? Remote viewing is alive and kicking. Wow. Let me go down and... So they really... I remember all of this and the reason that the U.S. got so into and started this remote viewing um, SRI was because Russia was really into it, right? Yeah, there was some um, thought about that uh, Russia was ahead of the U.S. in the, the psychic race. The psychic. This is during the Cold War, yeah. Yeah, um, they were actually uh, doing a lot of research, but the States also was. Oh, okay. So I see it as it was almost like a tag team. Oh. <laughs> One was ahead, then the other was ahead. Yeah. But um, I think they needed um, something new, something innovative, you know, to, to move forward. And uh, this seemed like a, a good idea at the time. <laughs> I remember reading that book. Everyone was reading Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah, I Everybody that. had that book. Yeah. It yeah. It's still kind of, people still read it. Yeah. Right. It's still available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us about the one you did um, with the, the murder mystery. Yeah. Um, I was tasked by a colleague. Uh, tasking just means somebody gives you a project. And um, normally they would give you just a, a case number mm -hmm. because if you have more information, sometimes imagination can kick in. So sometimes I can do a case with all that information and just set it aside. Um, but for this project, he gave me the code, the, this case number, we call it a coordinate or tasking number. Mm -hmm. And I did my thing, which was not the military method. This was using my own intuitive abilities. And I saw a vast amount of water between islands and land. Um, the water was brackish, so there was fresh water coming in 
it's from an estuary and you know and um i saw a, a body a dead body floating in the water among all of this kelp and i i told my colleague i said this is what i perceive i wrote it out for him and he said that can't be he said that's my friend that's missing he's been gone for four weeks we don't know where he is i don't think he's dead so i said well why don't i get some other remote viewers to to do the project as well we'll give them the coordinate mm -hmm. and they came up with a bunch more information um which confirmed that the that his friend this uh D, this california dj was indeed dead and he had been in the water um there's a whole story attached to it how um the dj had been befriended by a businessman who had a, a big uh, vessel a yacht they would be go they were going to go sail around the world um but um the dj had come into some money from his family his, his father had passed away and the, the this guy who owned the yacht wanted that money mm. so out on the the yacht and shot him and uh, because he'd, he'd previously asked for the DJ to invest some of the money into the, the yacht for mm -hmm. repairs and renovations. So a lot of the money, a lot of that inheritance went into the boat. So they said, this DJ's gone. We don't know where he is, you know. Uh. Um, <laughs> um, but then family friends and other friends said, no, we only saw him a week ago. He seemed fine. Mm -hmm. um, he plans to travel um, so they brought in the LA police department and um, they a fisherman actually dredged up the body mm. uh, on the water mm -hmm. and put in the, um, the coroner's office um, the case and um, my colleague uh, Robert Knight he's actually a, a famous photographer of uh, pop stars Oh, okay. He's an interesting guy too. Uh -huh. <laughs> and his wife Marianne is also a photographer. And um, they saw on the TV, they were, Marianne and John and uh, Robert were in LA watching TV. And here comes this news about this body being dredged up out of the water on the news. Yeah. About how this body was missing several fingers. And Robert goes, that's him. That's my friend. Oh. <laughs> so, uh -huh. yeah, so they were able then to be interviewed and identified the body. I mean, just amazing set of coincidences. Yeah. yeah. And, and then um, for the LAPD, it took several years for you to find out all that, didn't it? Um. I found out from Robert when after they oh, had seen, found out and Robert. then they also contacted I, me and others um, about remote viewing and um, they actually the History Channel Mistress of the Mind put on an episode where I was interviewed and they also interviewed these LA um, officers oh, okay. the um, detectives department stating yes they had re used remote viewing to um you know they used that information that we had given them to yeah. ascertain who, who he was wow yeah <laughs> that I was so exciting something when the lapd like is acknowledging remote viewing is working right yeah they actually came on to national public television uh -huh. on history channel and confirmed that they had used our remote viewing information to right. help solve the case, yes. I mean, and here the government's using it for worldwide stuff. So. <laughs> it's used in so many applications now, yes. Yeah. So I remember you also, um, there was something, uh, Jupiter, you discovered some, there was some. Oh, the rings, rings of Saturn. Yeah. Uh, the rings of Saturn and also Jupiter, yeah. Um, because I had read, this was years, decades ago, I'd read about how Ingo Swan had uh, uh, remote viewed Jupiter and um, seen rings around it. Mm -hmm. At the time, it, was, it wasn't thought to have rings, and everyone 
ridiculed it and said, no, it can't be here. So, um, and later when the, when the probes went out to space and they found, they noticed these rings around uh, Jupiter. So back in the 1980s, I thought, I'm going to go take a look. I'm going to use the out-of-body experience and I'm going to go to Jupiter and see what I can see. Uh -huh. I didn't see but I saw lots of other um, landmarks and features of, uh, I went right down to the surface. And now they've had um, probes go out there and again confirmed a lot of what I had received, which was I perceived these large bodies of what looked like water, but were not water. They were a different molecular structure. Uh -huh. And they confirmed that those are there. Wow. And that just um, when you mentioned Ingo Swan, he was so famous in all of this. And I remember when that was all starting, kind of that he was this big Scientologist at the Celebrity Center here in L.A. He was he was a beginner Scientologist. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was as was um, Hal Putoff and many other people. In, yeah, they said he brought like a whole for the SRI program for the government. They brought a whole bunch of Scientologists. Because I think they were doing similar stuff within Scientology. They were, and he adopted some of their techniques and brought them into the remote viewing protocol. But yeah. it's not a Scientology protocol right. because Ingo and Hal and others split with Scientologists mm -hmm. um, after they had become in involved with SRI. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Because I know yeah. they have the operating Thetan when people get to that level where they can travel and remote view you know right yeah and um yeah but as i said they both um how put off and russell targ um uh, sorry how put off um from what i know were into scientology in the beginning mm -hmm. but then uh left it um mm -hmm. to focus more on the scientific aspects and the research aspects for it this Ingo Swan was just amazing how he could do things and go through Faraday cages and find, remember right. talking yeah. about that? and I met him many times. You did? Uh, when I was working at Princeton, I used to go up to Manhattan on the, uh, on the bus sometimes or on the train and mm -hmm. um, spend the day with him. And uh, he would bring out his books and his theories and his philosophies and Wow. So it was amazing. And he actually wrote the foreword uh, to my first book, Remote Perceptions. Wow, that's fabulous. Yeah. He was a great guy. He was a curmudgeon. I call him a curmudgeon. Well, he was but just he this personality. He, he, did a lot of, he had a lot of <laughs> interesting stuff with the moon, didn't he? Yeah. You know, structures on the moon and all of that. Yeah, yeah. That seems to be coming more into vogue. I, like in some of these remote viewing sites and things, they're talking about the structures on the moon, like people concentrating on that and going. Right. On. Yes. Yeah. There's quite a lot of uh, information out there. Different groups, different people, different viewers have uh, looked at the moon and the back of the moon. Mm hmm. So, and so, like, how, when, when, during this whole time that I was interested in this, so a friend had um, uh, gone to Ed Dames. He was a remote viewer back then. And so he had his protocol. So we yeah. were doing the protocol, but during that one, it was that you always did it with a partner because that partner kept pushing you and keeping you up. Yeah, that's called working with a monitor. Okay. Uh, but we don't all have the luxury of a monitor. So most of my work I do solo. And I've learned to work solo and to push myself uh -huh. <laughs> and say, what what else is there? What what's next? Go look at this. Go look at that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and the other thing that they had in within that was that you um, you didn't use nouns. You tried to keep using like gerunds, like swimming, seeing, doing the adjectives. So you didn't identify it till you actually. Got right. You couldn't bring it. Yes, this is with the controlled remote viewing uh, protocol, CRV, which was brought in um, by Ingo Swan and, and Hal Putoff, mm -hmm. and, um, which I've been trained in with Lynn Buchanan and Paul Smith. And um, 
it's very easy for mental noise to slip in. Yeah. If you've got two hemispheres of the brain. We've got the logical left side in most people and the more open-ended and holistic side of the brain on the right side. Um, so we're trying to keep the left side, the logical side busy with writing and saying the data as you oh, proceed, okay. you write it and say it. Mm -hmm. You don't use any nouns, you don't use names of things until you're way into the structure. Mm -hmm. like or stage six. Um, and uh, you have to put all of these when something creeps in, like if you're getting red, rubbery, round, bouncy sounds, oh, it must be a rubber ball. Mm -hmm. that, that is left brain mental noise okay. because your brain is going, I know what that is. Yeah. Put that off to the side, you write it under a specific protocol there, what you perceived. Mm -hmm. Set it aside mm -hmm. so that you go back into your session and say, okay, I need more descriptors now, descriptive information. Mm -hmm. So wow. it's pretty disciplined. Yeah. I always remember I read that book, I think Perceptions or whatever by Ingo uh, Slam. But it, he was talking about the signal to noise. Right, yeah. To say signal that over to noise ratio. Yeah. 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 The, the noise is problem. all that mental clatter that goes on. Yeah. Clutter and clutter. <laughs> yeah. So then I know that you've also um, been into aliens or ETs. I've like always had an, Yeah, I've always had an interest right from being a little girl because my both my parents were interested and had seen UFOs um, in our skies. I, I grew up in Bristol, England, on the outskirts of the city. Um, and so I was always interested and um, wasn't until I suppose I was in my 30s, 30s, um, mid 30s, mm -hmm. that I became seriously interested and started doing more reading on the topic and doing, excuse me, some personal research. Mm -hmm. And I ended up writing a book with a colleague, C.B. Scott Jones, um, uh, who has since passed away, sadly. Um, uh, Voices from the Cosmos and we wrote a book using some of his information and some of my information. Yeah, because I like you had like from the um, that man you worked with for nine years, didn't yeah, you? With Jay. Didn't, he, didn't he start something where you were identifying all the all of the um, are you calling them aliens? Is that Different. how are you? Visit, I call them visitors. Yeah. Visitors. Um, okay. <laughs> or ETs. Um, people have different names for them. Genetic cousins. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like the term visitors. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, talk, talk about that. Yeah. He contacted me and um, he would often call me up and bend my ear and but lots of different theories he had. And he said, um, can you use remote viewing? to talk to the aliens, to talk to aliens. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, uh, we could think about it <laughs> and look at, see if we could find a protocol to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so gave it a, a couple of weeks and um, it ended up with us doing a year's work on this. Um, oh. I call it interviewing because it was not the classic remote viewing. Um, I would have all the questions that the client wanted to answer, have answered, plus some questions of my own, already typed up in my computer. Mm -hmm. I would sit at my computer and enter what I call the zone, which is my space where I do remote viewing and other esoteric work. And it's made basically just an altered state, but I'm not unconscious. I'm not in a trance. I'm not, I'm not um, channeling. It's just my, my mental space. Okay. And I said, okay, this is the first one. Is there a tall gray out there that would like to talk to me and answer some questions? Feeling very foolish. <laughs> and thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> and the answers started coming in. And so I didn't hear them as such. You know, I wasn't auditorily hearing them. But the answers I was perceiving yeah. in a viewing sense. So I was typing in 
the answers as they were coming in, some of them which I didn't even understand and I'd have to ask clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you buy? You know? Right. So I knew it wasn't coming from me. Mm -hmm. um, we did the first one. I sent that off to the client, to Jay. And he said, great, here's another one. <laughs> So we got through, and those are actually now, um, 20 of those are published in Voices from the Cosmos as the ET interviews, as oh, well as wow. Jay's writing about his experiences. So what would they tell you, like? Um, the the Greys thought, for example, that abductions were beneficial for humans, which I totally <laughs> disagree with. Wow, because... Um, <laughs> they thought that they were um, providing further, you know, uh, experience and content in context for humans and also getting information for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that. I The um, reptilians, I, I interviewed them. They didn't want to be interviewed, but I'm very stubborn. Mm -hmm. So I just kept going. Um, and I asked them, what do you do? One of the questions was, what do you do if you meet a human on board a craft? Mm -hmm. and the answer was, we push them. Or, <laughs> or we make a loud noise at them. And I got the chills. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. So did the greys, there's so much chatter that the greys live in the earth. Did they, any of them tell you where they there are? There it? are branches of the greys that live in the earth, yes. Okay. That was confirmed. Because I remember you had the small greys and the, there were different greys. There are talls and the, and the shorts and there are, there are quite a few variations. Oh, okay. Yeah. But some live off planet. Um. I was from what I perceive, most of them live off planet, oh, okay. um, and some are visitors to the earth uh, for frequent visitors. Some of them. And did you get what planets that the different ones lived on? Or I tried, but they kept saying, "Well, our names for the planets are different than yours, so we can't tell you." <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. But were they? They were all friendly except for the reptilian. The reptilians were very, were not friendly. Um, the dark ones that I encountered um, was another race who attached themselves to people, which I didn't know. They're like shadows. Yeah. So I was, as I was asking the questions, I kept saying, please do not attach to me. Mm -hmm. and at the end, I asked, what do people need to do if they do get attached by these dark ones? And they said, simply just tell us to leave oh okay tell us to leave mm -hmm. they like angry emotions they like dark energy oh so they like it when people get all yeah angry and annoyed they bring and that kind of energy to the person they can attract it yeah but all they have to do is say leave me go away and uh -huh. they they will um they will leave uh-huh that's what they told me anyway <laughs> that had to be really interesting right i mean like every time you're going and then you're getting another group you know yes many of them yeah and that's a lot it was very interesting yeah there's so much talk these days about everybody's back into the Anun anunnaki and stitching and all that. that's making another go round oh that's the history of it all yeah there's a lot of that yeah so the anaki what were they like um very wise um oh. A little bit out of touch with modern people. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they said that Sitchin didn't have everything right. Mm -hmm. So I just wrote up what they told me, uh -huh. their opinions and ideas. Wow, so fascinating, all of this different things, you know. Have you ever gone um, done any remote viewing for missing people? I have, but I've really had to cut back because I was getting overwhelmed. I was having people contact me and say, my uncle disappeared 20 years ago. Where is he? Mm -hmm. And so I, I have parameters now. I will only work if this is a, a current case, an urgent case that the police are involved or their investigations underway already. 
and um, they're uh, knowledgeable about remote viewing and I can bring in my skills. Yeah. So I have to be very specific now and I have to disappoint a lot of people, I know, but, uh, you know, I'm getting older. So <laughs> that's my goal. I want those dark ones there. Yeah. So I have to be very specific about where I put my energies. Yeah. I remember I was a member of what was called digital dowsing. So it was okay. like way back, like when the computers were just coming on and there was a whole group yeah. and we're into um, looking for missing people. Because mm -hmm. another thing I saw interesting, ACV, Associated Controlled Remote Viewing, is dowsing, is how they... Associative, it's connected to dowsing, but it's basically remote viewing to potential outcomes yeah. and deciding from your data um, which one matches the actual outcome. Oh, I see. That's how it's used. I just saw that. In what, what Associative remote viewing. Yeah. And there's a whole, that's another whole stream yeah. that I'm not involved in now because I, I'm so focused on my writing. I teach remote viewing mm -hmm. um, and uh, do um, consulting for uh, for clients. Yeah, the, the problem I know with the um, digital dowsers, like all of these missing people, like you're saying, but then yeah. they found, you know, it had to be like, like you're saying, it had to be um, that it was, it, you work because so many people go missing purposely. They don't yeah. want to be found, you know what right. I mean? And so you're you're going against, you're doing something. And so you have to get permission and it has to be more. So they just actually discontinued it because it was problematic from those points of view. It can get messy, yeah. For example, if you're doing a parental abduction case, how do you know that which parent is the right parent for that child? Right. Are you going to be returning a child to an abusive parent? Mm-hmm. So I no longer do uh, parental abductions. Right. Well, the, all those little things you never really think about. You learn over the time, over time. Yeah. yeah. Well, this was so interesting, Angela. We went through like a million things, <laughs> <laughs> but they are all like so good. And um, I really want to thank you for coming on and sharing all your wisdom and uh can you want to give your website and how people can contact you and right the names um, of your books again? Yeah, well, I've written all my books are available on Amazon under my name, Angela Thompson Smith, author. Okay, that's pretty easy to remember, Angela Thompson Smith, author. My business is Mindwise Consulting, all mm -hmm. one word, mm -hmm. and the website is um, www.mindwiseconsulting.com. Mm -hmm. which is pretty easy too. And um, my email address is mindwiseconsulting at gmail.com. Okay, and I'll list that under the, the interview. Okay, thank you. So thank you so much. There's so much to think on all of this. Especially yeah, I've had an interesting life. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Great. Okay, thanks again. And uh, You're welcome. Else, thank we'll you. just see you in a few weeks. Bye. Thank you. And I'll be happy to come on again if ever you, you need. Oh, yeah. I would like to do one more in depth on the um, abductees, because I know you have two different types of abductees and all of that. I think people would love that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.